In your brain, neurons are separated by thin gaps. In those gaps, small chemicals called neurotransmitters are rushing from one side to the other, carrying messages. But what are these neurotransmitters? Why are they here? And how do they neurotransmit? In this video, we'll look at the story of the neurotransmitters. How they are born, how they get ready, the choices they face in the synaptic cleft, and what happens when they get to the other side. There are many different kinds of neurotransmitters, so we'll break this up into multiple videos. This one will cover classical neurotransmitters. They were the first to be discovered in the first half of the 20th century, and they include some of the legendary names like dopamine, adrenaline, and serotonin, although they also include less well-known but no less cool-sounding members like acetylcholine, GABA, glutamate, and others. In the next video, we'll look at a very different group of neurotransmitters, neuropeptides, or protein-based neurotransmitters. The other groups, like lipids and gases, will be covered in later videos. So, let's get started. Before we get into the main story, let's start with a prologue. Long ago, there were many different neurons. Here are two of them, for example. And they like to send electric spikes to each other, as messages. But when the messages got to the end of the neuron, there was a problem. Yes, sometimes the spikes in the first neuron needed to cause a spike in the next one, but sometimes it needed to suppress a spike. And sometimes one neuron wanted to tell the other neuron to change its behavior entirely. Maybe even change which genes it was expressing. And while this messaging was happening, neurons also needed help from other cells, like astrocytes, which could control the nearby blood vessels and could tell them to expand to provide more nutrients. So the neurons came up with an interesting idea. They would transfer these messages with little chemicals called neurotransmitters. Where the two neurons would need to transfer a message, they agreed to arrange each other in a synapse. This would be the presynaptic neuron, the one sending the messages. And that would be the postsynaptic neuron, the one receiving the messages. Between them, there would be a small gap, called a synaptic cleft, only 20 nanometers wide, that's about 20 billionths of a meter. And the job of the neurotransmitters, and their entire purpose of their existence, would be to cross the thin gap and touch the receptors on the opposite wall. And so, we are ready to begin the story of this particular batch of neurotransmitters, in the bulb of the presynaptic neuron. This story begins at the neurotransmitter's birth. There was nothing fancy about it, because this neuron had to fire signals many times per second. So if it didn't have a way to make neurotransmitters right in the synapse, it would quickly run out. So, our neurotransmitters were born right from the scraps that were lying around. If the neurotransmitter was dopamine, it would have been made in two quick steps from amino acid tyrosine. That's already floating around because it's needed to make proteins. If it was acetylcholine, then it would have been made by taking acetyl-coenzyme A. It's already there for turning nutrients into energy, and choline, and sticking them together. And if it was glutamate, then it wouldn't even need to be made at all. It's already floating around, so the neuron would just have to catch it, and ship it off to the synaptic wall. A given neuron would typically have either one kind of neurotransmitter, or a few. Just not all at once. Once born, these neurotransmitters didn't have time to waste. They didn't get any playtime, or education, they were conscripted right as they were. But they did need a ride, a synaptic vesicle. Synaptic vesicles are little bubbles made from basically the same stuff as the cell wall, a double layer of phospholipids. Plus a few proteins, some of which helped the neurotransmitters get in, some that anchored the vesicle to the wall once it got there, and some that, well, we're not sure what they were actually for, scientists are still working on that. Each synaptic vesicle packed thousands of neurotransmitter molecules, and the number of vesicles, anywhere between a couple to a few dozen, weighted by the presynaptic wall, either attached to it, or floating right behind. Inside them, the neurotransmitters crowded together, nervously waiting for the action to start. Without a warning, the voltage in the axon began to rise, the electric spike had arrived. The presynaptic wall had calcium ion channels that opened when the voltage increased. And now they were open, and calcium ions were flooding into the cell. 
Many of the calcium ions stuck to the proteins that attach the vesicle to the cell wall, and these proteins zip together and slump the vesicle into the wall. The vesicle popped open, and the neurotransmitters spilled out. Here, the neurotransmitters faced a choice. Sure, they could go fulfill their mission by attaching to the opposite wall, or they could diffuse toward the exit from the cleft and see what destiny awaited them there. Or, well, they could just float around where they were and do nothing. Let's see what happened to the neurotransmitters that took each path. This neurotransmitter was a firm believer in its neuron's mission, and it headed straight for the nearest receptor on the postsynaptic wall. It quickly attached to the receptor to deliver its message, and, well, what happened next would have to depend on what neurotransmitter this was, as well as on the receptor. If the neurotransmitter was acetylcholine, glutamate, or serotonin, then this could have been a receptor that opened an ion channel that would have let in sodium or calcium ions then the incoming ions would have raised the voltage in the postsynaptic neuron and would have made the electric spike more likely to start there. If the neurotransmitter was GABA or glycine, then the receptor could have opened a channel that would have let chlorine ions in. These are negatively charged, so they would have reduced the voltage in the neuron and would have suppressed any spike that was trying to start there. Or, this receptor could have been coupled to a messenger protein called G-protein. And when the neurotransmitter would have bound to that, the G-protein would have detached and kicked off a chemical chain reaction that could have done... Well, anything. Either way, the neurotransmitter pressed the button, delivered the message, and was ready to return. So now it madly swam back to its neuron, towards the reaptic proteins, entered the neuron, and was welcomed back as a hero. It didn't get much rest, though. Neurons are harsh bosses. More spikes were coming, so the neuron immediately reloaded the neurotransmitter into another vesicle. It didn't even have time to go to the washroom. What the neurotransmitter didn't know, but would soon find out, was that it was lucky. The neuron doesn't have use for neurotransmitters who don't work hard. Those neurotransmitters who hang around too long outside of the vesicles get taken apart by special enzymes, with the parts reused elsewhere in the neuron. On the next release, a few neurotransmitters decided that they've had enough, and when the vesicle popped open, they started diffusing toward the exit from the cleft. There, they were in for a surprise, because wrapped around the synapse was an appendage of another cell, an astrocyte. Astrocytes are big branched cells that live in the brain and fill the space between the neurons. And this astrocyte made a deal with a neuron long before these neurotransmitters were born. You see, astrocytes enjoy cleaning up leftover neurotransmitters, which is why they wrap around the synapses, so they could do it better. But the neurotransmitters didn't know that. So on their way out, many of them were lured into the astrocytes' shiny uptake transporters. But once they entered the astrocyte, they were quickly disabled and taken apart by the astrocyte's enzymes. Their remains were either repurposed by the astrocyte's internal machinery or spit back out into the extracellular fluid to be picked up by the neurons and to be made into the next generation of neurotransmitters. But our neurotransmitter hung back and didn't enter the astrocyte. And once he saw what happened, he decided to diffuse carefully around the astrocyte's uptake transporters. And then, on the way out, it finally saw a way to get revenge on the neuron. On the side of the synapse, and on the rest of the body of the neuron, it saw autoreceptors that it could bind to. The neurotransmitter heard rumors of these and what they would do. So on the way out, it bound to one, and stayed just long enough to see the autoreceptor kick off a chain reaction that suppressed production of more neurotransmitters from the remains of his friends. And then it moved into the open extracellular fluid to begin its new life of freedom. Hey, this is Yuri from The Excited Neuron. Thanks for watching this video. So, I just started this channel a few weeks ago, and I am still trying to ramp it up. If you like this video, and if you're curious about how you can help out, the best way to do this would be to show this video to your friends. But only if you think they would enjoy it. Please don't spam anyone. Thanks for watching, 
and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the future.